Hey guys, Gam back here in the, uh, the Battler workshop. Well, it's been a while since I've been in the workshop. Um, work has taken over, and when you do work in the contracting game, and work is there, you take it because you never know when it's going to uh, when it's going to dry up. You never know when that next job is going to come around the corner. So, um, obviously, family and work always come first before the workshop. It's not the way I'd like it to be, but unfortunately, that's uh, that's life and that's reality. Um, obviously, no work's been done on the uh, on the Victoria Mill at all. Um, last time I left you, we talked about coming up with some sort of a, a mobile or portable jib crane that we can use to lift the heavy accessories off the mill caddy uh, onto the milling machine or onto the table. And uh, I've done some design work around that, so we'll go and have a look at that in a little while. Um, but at the heart of that design is, is this particular type of winch. And this is called a brake winch. Uh, most winches you see on the boat. Um, have the pawl, but they have a, a release mechanism for the pawl that allows you to unwind it. These brake winches work a little bit differently than that. So, you hear the pawl working away there. As we winch the load, as soon as that load comes on, and it tries to run away from us, this locks up. And see how that locks up there. To release it, we just work in reverse and we can wind it down. As soon as that load comes back on again, it self locks. Let's get up a little bit closer and we'll have a look at this mechanism from the outside. And then we'll do a strip down and we'll have a look at how that operates uh, in reality. Okay guys, this is the uh, mechanism up close. So we've got our, our large gear, we've got our small drive pinion that's mounted on our, on our drive shaft. Now if I just actuate that handle backwards and forwards, you'll see that small pinion gear working laterally along that shaft. It's actually mounted on a multi-start high lead thread. And what's inside here are two brake discs or clutch discs that jam the pawl into place. So as that moves across it actually locks that pawl up. And when we try and rotate it, it gets tighter against those clutch plates, which locks it even harder and stops the load running away from us. Once again, to break it, we reverse it, pulls the, uh, the gear away, releases the clutch plates, and allows us to rotate it backwards or unwind. As soon as the load comes back on again, it locks. All right, let's do a breakdown of this. We'll pull this apart. We'll have a look at uh, a little bit more in depth as to uh, as to what this uh, what this uh, arrangement is made up of. All right, guys, I thought I might just quickly show you what this brake assembly looks like on this winch, and uh, it's quite a simple design. It's uh, very elegant, I think. Um, it's only made up of a few components. It's got a uh, small pinion gear with a thrust washer. It's got two brake discs or clutch discs. It's got a pawl wheel and it's got a fixed washer. What I mean by fixed washer, it's actually on a square, it can't rotate, but it can move actually on the shaft. Now if we have a close look at the pinion, when we rotate the pinion, it's actually on a long lead multi-start thread. So it is captured. You can actually see it as I rotate, you can see it moving actually along the shaft there. So the idea is that when we go to winch, the pinion moves along the shaft, applies a thrust load onto the brake discs, which locks the pinion wheel, sorry, the pawl wheel in place, which allows the pawl to then come into play and lock the assembly from rotating, locks our load in, in, uh, into place, stops it from dropping. If we rotate the shaft, we momentarily take the pinion back away from the thrust plates, which allows the assembly to free wheel, allows us to drop the load as soon as we let go, thrust comes back on again, locks the, th the uh, the pawl wheel in place allows the pawl to then lock it, stop it from dropping. So a very simple, elegant design. All right, well, let's have a look. We'll break this down, and uh, we'll just have a look at uh, how we're going to go about using this in uh, in our design. If we can keep it the same, we're going to modify it. And what we can do. All right, we'll see in a tick, guys. Right, a little bit of an issue trying to get this solid pin out. Um, from this end it's been driven in, but at the other end it's a smaller sized hole 
and the silver pin bottoms out on the end so virtually it's a blind hole so I can't get a pin punch to grab onto it that way to punch it out and I certainly can't punch it out that way with the uh, the hole that's undersized on that side so yeah bit of a problem the only way that that's ever going to come out is if I drill it so I'm going to leave it for the time being if I need to modify this shaft uh, in a major way uh, then we'll look at taking that off but I'll try and modify it using this as it is and shortening it up a little bit bit of a pain anyway it's not a great groundbreaker for us we'll work around it all right guys let's have a look at this uh, design we've come up with so here's the body of the show and then we've got a jib arm and we've got a pivot arm that operate off that main body let's have a look inside so inside you can see where we've used the components out of our out of our brake winch there's the main gear that we've got there I'm going to mount that onto a hub and onto a uh, onto a shaft is it here so it's actually just tack welded in place so we'll japan that off and machine that out so that we can uh, we can fit a hub onto that and that hub is going to be fitted on with a couple of series of soft header cap screws we can see in here we can see the the brake assembly there's our pawl wheel with our pawl and uh, in the green there are our brake disc or clutch discs and there's our pawl moving around the other side we've got the blind side I've put a shaft extension on here and the plan is that I'm going to put another hand wheel on here I'd like to get away from these uh, these handles and put a hand wheel in place uh, and this is a, a shaft that's got a key cut in it ready to uh, to accept a hand wheel on it right inside the shaft that we've got carrying through here which has got uh, which is from our, our hub which is going to be mounted to our large gear got a chain sprocket inside here and you can see that shaft extension from the drive shaft or the small pinion shaft that we're going to have to do I haven't shown the chain in but the chain will drop down and then through uh, through the tube now these pivot arm and the jib arm they're going to be made up at a bit of um, shed 40 inch and a half pipe sorry shed 80 I'll we'll be doing those at a shed 80 I think so nice and thick plenty of rigidity to them the castings that we're going to do are the aluminium castings are the housing castings here and uh, you might notice I've beefed them up quite a bit where they're going to need them so we've got good engagement in here and a lot of meat around here which is going to support any offset loads that we're going to apply um, due to our heavy lifts and up inside here when we do get it round I miss my old space wheels that I used to use on this so once again we've got a head up here this is going to be turned up at a mile steel and we've got another small pinion up here which is what the chain is going to run over and then drop down we will have our, our hook attached that's fairly straightforward that and that's going to be a uh, a press fit into uh, into the tube so we'll machine a register back inside there and we'll fit that into place like I said I do miss my space wheels that I used to have but uh, <laughs> we'll try and get it around. All right. Let's see better now that the heart of the unit. If the housing's out of the way. All right. So it's looking all okay at the moment with that uh, with that design. The hardest part of this is going to be doing the housing castings. So uh, 
I've already designed the patterns and I've coated the machining for those ready for the CNC. So we'll have a quick look at how we've uh, how we've knocked those patterns up. All right, first pattern. This is the one where the handle is at the moment. Now the way that stands at the moment, it's too long. It's around about well, I think it's about 80 millimeters long there, which is too long for my tooling and machining around that. The cord's going to jam into the body, so I've got to break this down into two parts. And as you can see off the end here, we can see the, uh, the two core prints that we're going to pick up, and I'll show you how that core is going to look. Um, one thing, great thing with these solids modeling packages, this one's in Inventor, is that we can actually do a draft check on them. So if we look at the scale here, and it's in red is zero draft, moving up to green, which is up to three degrees. So if we click our pull point and we hit OK, we can see that everything there is in green. And obviously the bits that you can't pull out of the sand are in red and blue. So I've done that with all the patterns. And it just makes it very visual to make sure that you haven't left any surfaces without a tape that you can draw out of the sand. So as I said, we're going to split this into two. So what I've had to do there is basically create a, a muffin top, if you like. And we've taken that extension, which actually houses the, uh, the gear assemblies. I've taken that out. So this will be one pattern. And we've got the muffin top, which is this bloke here. This will be a second pattern. So we'll glue those two together once we've, uh, we've got them machined up. All right, that's our core box, or one of the core boxes. This is the core box or core box half for the non-drive side or the non-handle side. And that's our core box for the handle side. Now, I've put a cavity in here, which is where the hub for the main large gear is gonna come through. And that's gonna allow me to rest this on the sand on the drag. Um, I've only got a small core print up here and a small core print down here that this is going to sit in. If it wasn't supported, it would tend to fall over in the cavity. So uh, this will create a nice little seat, if you like, for this core to, um, to sit on the, uh, the uh, sand uh, on, the, uh, on the drag side of the mould. Bit of a perspective there, you can see how that drops in there. So that's our patterns that we've designed up and what I've been able to do with all of these patterns is that I do what's create called a derived scale on these. And what that means is uh, I actually accommodate in the sizing of this the shrinkage. So I've allowed for one and a half percent on the aluminium. So uh, I derive the part um, by a percentage to give me that one and a half percent growth on the patterns. As I said, that accommodates for the shrinkage of the aluminium. All right, so that's our little jib crane, our portable jib crane. In a nutshell, um, I'm going to make up various feet for this. So this will be one that I can mount on the uh, on the milling machine table. I'll have another one that I can design up to mount the tool post or the lathe. So these I'll I'm not expecting to lift any more than gosh, maximum weight 100 kilo on these. Although it will lift more. The castings that I do are going to be a different story. I, I no longer have my foundry. Um, so we're going to have to jerry rig something up, and I'd like to give these a T6 heat treat. And along with my foundry, I had my kiln that I did my T6 heat treats in, and also normalisation of cast iron. So uh, we're going to have to look at another way that I can do the heat treat on those uh, on those castings. All right, guys. Before I move on, I'll, I'll just show you where I've used one of these brake winches in a in a design here at home. As I said, I designed a lot of these or did a lot of design work with these in industry for um, for, for uh, small process machines. 
for uh, picking gear up and um, components up and loading. Um, this is a website I built back in 2000, I think it was, a long time ago. This was my uh, gas-fired furnace. This uh, was capable of doing up to, to 50 kilo of iron. Um, I had a, an overhead crane that would come down and, and pick up the uh, the crucibles. Um, you can see this Jarrett brake winch here, very expensive unit, but uh, very high quality and close on 300 kilo of castable that's lifting up and, and holding quite comfortably. Uh, down the track I did cut this in half and uh, make that into a pivot so that I could rotate the entire body right around enable full access with the um, with the crane to uh, to lift the crucible up and the uh, the lifting jig was also the pouring jig so we only had to uh, to attach once and uh, take it over to the pouring station just another view of it there you can see in the background there you'll see a large pit furnace uh, we could pour up to or melt up to uh, 100 kilo of uh, aluminium in that and uh, certainly got well used And uh, there it is in action, just flying off. This is just after I actually, uh, I'd actually just built this unit. But uh, yep, that was our foundry that uh, that we ran, and uh, it was very successful. But uh, gosh, the amount of time we had to spend there was uh, it wasn't worth it in the end with uh, with a young family. So uh, decided to pack it in. Actually, I'll show you what we did start off with originally. which was a coupler. So that was a nine inch coupler. And that was capable of putting out around 250 kilo of iron per hour. It was a, a very, very good runner, but gosh, you got exhausted by the end of the day. You Once once this got up and running, you did not stop. And uh, when I built the oil-fired furnace, that was great. You could turn it on and go and have a cover and, and wait for the melt to happen. But this thing here, you had to be on it all the time, charging with, uh, with coke iron and lime, and then continually tapping. So, uh, good fun, but uh, it did start to wear thin after a while. I won't blow this photo up because he wants to remain and probably wants to be a bit enormous, but that's, uh, that's Lucky Gen 101. Yeah, a lot of you guys might have uh, visited his website. Um, very, very experienced uh, man that does uh, a lot of casting at home, and uh, we used to sort of um, pop into each other's foundry to give each other a bit of a hand as we went. Let me see, it's doing a preheat on the, on a crucible. And uh, I think this was our, our first tapping that we ever did. Myself and my mate Ian pouring it out. And uh, this is our first casting. Did a couple of compressor um, housings for a Lyco and, and there's a Lyco wheel in it. That was for an R-Class, seven and a quarter R-Class. So uh, we did a series of those. Nothing like the old days. All right, let's uh, have a bit of a look at some uh, some coating that we've done to uh, to fabricate or machine up these uh, these patterns, eh? Right, before we start any uh, any coating, um, we always start off with some stock that we're going to machine this out of. And um, this is the stock for the non-handle, the blind side as I've called it. And you can see the build-ups that I've put in here for the bosses and also for those neck collars there. Um, with timber patterns, I try and make the stock as close to the, uh, the pattern size with allowance uh, to minimise a lot of fresh air machining or wasted machining. So uh, you're only machining the stock that you need to machine. So I make up my own stock. Uh, when you're uh, doing coating in uh, in metal for CNC machines, you tend to work with uh, with blocks uh, more so than uh, than shapes like we do in pattern making. So that's the blind side or the non-handle side uh, with the stock. You can see uh, laid out over the top of it. All ready to go. And I've created my machining programs here, and I've only got three here. I've got a horizontal roughing and two parallel finishing. Uh, once again, when you're working in steel, um, you'll find that this tree will be a lot, lot longer with a lot of different machining operations in it. And usually with uh, with uh, CNC machines where you're machining metal, it tends to be two and a half um, pocketing, um, more so than full three axis uh, machining. So um, as I said, these trees get 
quite long depending on all the machining operations that you're putting in. So we've created, as I said, we've created our, our machining tool paths. Uh, that's the one for the, uh, for the horizontal roughing. We've got the parallel finish in one direction and the parallel finishing in the other direction. So uh, this is a very good program. This one here you can do full simulation of your, of your machining paths. And once again, you can sort of see that we're not really machining a lot of dead air. Uh, as if we were to make this out of a complete block, the fact that we've been able to shape this to suit the final shape makes uh, things a lot more efficient. Now, once again, we've got the parallel mach or the uh, machine. We won't go through that because it is a fairly slow process, but um, you can see the horizontal finishing happening there. You can see the uh, that muffin top that we've got off the uh, off the handle side, and once again we've got our machining operations, our roughing, our parallel, and our other parallel at 90 degrees. And there's our core. So once again we have our roughing operations. We have a parallel finishing through the entire arrangement parallel finishing through the entire range and I put a secondary parallel finishing in just in that pocket there to get the 90 degrees running this way and this way so that's going to become our, uh, our call boxes alright that's uh, that's it in a nutshell as I said they're all coded um, I've got to post these yet um, I would have to do a little bit of hand manipulation on the code with some of the tooling changes on this um, my post processor doesn't quite work the way I want it to um, let's go and look at some of the stock that I've already got laminated up to uh, to machine the uh, the patterns, and uh, we'll see where we're going to go from there. All right, so I've laminated up all my stock, and I've actually created a, a paper outline of the uh, of the raw stock that we're going to mount up in the CNC, and uh, we've got the apertures that we're going to put on here for the bosses on this one that will come off we'll turn that over for the other pattern and we'll create some stock for that I just I just draw the outline on this and then we'll just get in we'll bandsaw uh, bandsaw out the shape ready to set up in the CNC all right that's it in a nutshell so hopefully uh, next time we come back we'll see a little bit of action on the CNC and we can uh, see some finished patterns coming off ready to uh, to mould up ready for casting. Alright guys, we'll see you soon.